Um, so I hope I won't confuse you too much this morning with talk of the different European institutions. But before I begin my presentation, I should just explain a little bit the context of Europe that you may not see on a day-to-day -day basis with your dealings. I think for most of you, your main partner is the European Commission. And some people have the idea that the European Commission then has various small parts, such as the European Parliament. But this is not the case. Each are separate institutions. And as you'll see from my presentation, all the institutions come together in partnership on various issues, one of them being language technology. In particular, for language technology, it's not the whole institution that's coming together, but it's the part which is dealing with uh, translation in particular. Okay? So, very briefly, what I'm going to talk about is I'll give you the background information about the cooperation that we have interinstitutionally. I'll tell you a little bit about how we work together. Then I'll spend quite a bit more time on the areas that we're dealing with. And finally, I have a, a few questions for you, uh, the things that we need answered in the next few years, some of which we really don't have a clue what we're going to do about them and are going to cause us some huge problems. So, first of all, the confusing part. Um, Interinstitutional cooperation is at various levels. So, as I said, it's the translation parts of each of the institutions. And we have a large committee, first of all, at the top, the Interinstitutional Committee for Translation and Interpretation. And what that brings together is all the different parts of the European institutions that deal not only with translation, but also with interpreting. Um, we share some common needs, but we also have some very different needs as well. So the idea is that below that level, we have different committees, one dealing with translation, one dealing with interpreting. And within the translation part, we have two levels of organization. I said it would be confusing. The first level is the executive level. This brings together the leaders of those directorates or those institutions. And the second level brings together the people that actually know what they're talking about. So we have two very different levels, the ones who can make the decisions and the ones who know which decisions should be made. Finally, below that, we have a series of projects, of tools that we're developing together, and also of networks. And the Interinstitutional Language Technology Watch is one of those networks. OK, you've probably already forgotten all of that. Uh, I will come back to some of these things, but one of the things you'll notice is that within the European institutions, we love acronyms. So if you see some of the acronyms later that aren't clear, you have to bring your mind back to this slide. I'll try and remember to explain them as I go. So um, the sort of things that the Language Technology Watch is there to do is to really be a framework for all the activities that we're doing um, between the institutions. So that means we're looking at ways to structure the cooperative actions that we can take. The main one is really information flow we have lots of people working in different areas, and we want to make sure that as far as possible, we can share that information to really build on the expertise in the different institutions. In some cases, that means that we will see an area where really we can merge the efforts which are being made and have more permanent collaboration. Now, that permanent collaboration could take the form of um, a project, a software tool that could be developed, or it could simply be adding um, added value to the tools which are being produced within each institution. Um, we also, one of the things we're really thinking about is we're not simply a producer of language technology or a consumer of language technology. We are very much both, and also we're a massive data resource. So we really, we have part of every um, area that you will be taking on. And the sort of projects that you're producing now are the sort of things that will lead into what we're using in the future. But at the same time, we're looking at technologies around language that we're using today. And I think that's something which is quite a difference from the sort of things that we were talking about yesterday, is that we're not only looking at cutting edge language technologies, but we're also, and mainly, looking at technology which is there to allow us to do our job better now. So when we're talking about translation, that's not just the job of actually translating a text, but there's a lot more around that as well. There's the job of producing a text which is suitable for translation. 
There's the job of finding a workflow which makes sure that everybody is involved, that the communication works at all stages. And, of course, there's also the fact that some of the text that we get in may not be in a form that we can easily use. So how do we convert that from, for example, a handwritten PDF file to something which we can actually translate easily? So it's a, a broader context, in a way, than some of the things that were discussed yesterday. OK, some of our members, just to give you an idea of how many institutions make up the, the family. Um, the European Parliament, I'm sure you've heard of. Then we have the Council, the European Commission. In particular, we're talking about the Directorate General for Translation for the European Commission. Um, then we have the Court of Justice, the European Central Bank. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but you can see them all there. One thing to note is that these are all very different institutions with very different sizes and, in many cases, very different needs. We all share the common goal to be able to produce the, the language that we're using in a multilingual environment. However, we do it in a very different way. If we take the one I just mentioned, the European Central Bank, for example, it just has one or two translators for each language, and it's working mainly from English. Whereas we take something like the European Parliament or the two committees that I work for, the European Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions, in our environment, we're working from every single language, uh, official language of the European Union, into every other official language of the European Union and beyond. Now, the needs of a translation service there are very different, but we do share some common problems. So on to... Uh, the mandate for the Language Technology Watch. The vision is to become a trusted forum for the exchange of information. That's the main idea. We want to identify the global developments, that means at places like this, and we need to find out which of those are relevant for our needs here and now, as well as in the future. So we want to pull the information together. We want to be able to forecast what technology is coming and how that will affect our work. And we need to make sure that not only do the experts in language technology within the institutions know about that, but also the translators, because they're all wondering how their job will be affected in the future. And not only them, but the people who have their hands on the money, because they're wanting to know, well, what are we getting out of this? How is all this technology helping us? And that's something which is one of the questions we have at the end. So the sort of things that we've been looking at over the last year and a half that we've been in existence, um, we've looked a little bit about quality assurance. I'll go through all of these in detail afterwards. XML authoring tools, machine translation, I'm not going to talk about very much because Spiros will talk about that. Um, conversion from other formats, workflow tools, electronic dictionaries, teleworking, proofing tools, and terminology extraction. It's a very broad base. And as you'll see there, there's a huge difference between some quite advanced technologies and really some quite basic technologies that we still haven't worked out exactly how to best use. So let's go through each of these in turn. Um, you'll notice in each of these slides, there's one of the uh, institutions in the top right-hand corner. That's because for each project, we have a lead institution um, who are trying to make sure that we move forward in the area. So first of all, quality assurance. Um, obviously here we're wanting to find tools that will help us improve the internal consistency within a document. This is particularly important in an institution like my own where we are producing documents commonly in 22 languages. Now, we're producing them in 22 languages and we don't have translators who can translate from 21 languages to another 22. Um, so what in actual fact we're doing is we have a translation normally from one language into a PIVO language such as English, French and German and then translate it into the rest. So consistency at that level is very important. I mean, Obviously you can't get a perfect translation which is perfectly equivalent in all those languages but we need to get as close to that ideal as possible. Um, so some of the things that we've been looking at, the Commission's investigated Aerospire and QA Distiller we need to do more work in this area to find out um, how well these perform. However, we're sort of in standby mode on this because uh, we're waiting for the current generation of cat tools to be available. And that's something which has been ongoing for a couple of years. 
because it would appear that most of them provide quality assurance tools that may give us exactly what we need. The next one is something which is really before the text gets us, which is how do we try to limit the authors so that they produce something which we can easily translate? 